for the grand finale we are bringing you the last keynote of the day it's been a pretty exciting day filled with a rich content and the african flavor to the conference today's last speaker will sweep you off your feet he's an amazing business educator and he holds credentials from a number of high profile institutions amongst them are of course the henley business school london business school duke corporate education he also is involved in the Pelt Business School. He's a world-class motivational speaker. He has spoken in the most amazing platforms like TED Global, Google's Zedgist. He's an author of 10 books, and two of them have been in the Financial Times publishing bestsellers. He's dubbed by Financial Times as the leading revolutionary. He's the agent provocateur. He's the remarkable Eddie Obeng, and he's dubbed by Chris Anderson of TED as the remarkable Eddie Obeng. Ladies and gentlemen, let me present to you Professor Eddie Obeng, and today he'll be speaking on the topic, leading together to successful change, how to harness the opportunities of our changing, complex and ambiguous world through interdependent co-creation. Be prepared to be swept off your feet. Over to you, Prof. Thank you very much, Mamza. Um, this is quite um, difficult because you've had such a wonderful day. I mean, you started with Mike, and then you've gone. You went through Anchor. You went through that wonderful uh, presentation from Lisa Armstrong, and then you've talked about digital with people like Mazin, and you've talked with Gladys about things like you know being the change. And you've had this wonderful day, and now Mamza has done that that wonderful introduction, which makes me seem all up there, and now pressure and stress. So um, I'm going to do my best to try to ooh, rise to the occasion, which is what I'm hoping you will do as, as project uh, leader. No pressure, Prof. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just uh, let me just set the context for you a little bit. So <clears throat> what I was hoping to do was uh, something which is a little bit difficult for me um, uh, because I'm an introvert. <laughs> I know you don't believe me. But I was going to use my life story to explain how I'd learned about projects and how I began to educate people in projects and some wider lessons for you and for us within Africa as we start to try and deal with the joys, the opportunities and the challenges of the current uh, world which we're living in. So that's, that's sort of the plan. Um, if I just quickly um, promptly share my screen with you, I'm hoping that we can have a chance to um, to explore things, but I'm going to make a guess at what the outcomes you would want would be. So I'm going to make a guess that actually what you guys would want is, um, let me come a bit closer here, you're hoping for uh, to avoid the same old stuff we've always done. You're hoping for a bit of fun at the end of the day, uh, some insights, you want some practical breakthroughs, maybe some methods on how to behave and how to act, some concrete things to take away, some good versions of stories in your minds. And those are what you're after. Oh, no, those aren't your fears. These are your hopes. <laughs> I think these are your hopes and that's your fear. Is that right? <laughs> My fears are that uh, you're looking for a show uh, and you don't take any notes. You will have noticed already. I speak very fast. The session is being recorded. Take notes and you can watch it again later. Also, my biggest fear is that you'll be Zoombies. You know what Zoombies are when you've got your phone and your old time Zoombies are, uh, okay, modern Zoombies, they're on their phones like that. So I hope you will not be Zoombies. So that's, that's sort of the plan for you. So three stages. And after each stage, I will pose a question. I will ask Bumza to tell me what's in the chat. I will answer it and then I'll move on. So like three acts to my life. The first act will be just how I became uh, uh, an adult, because basically I've been traveling now for over 60 years. Um, it's been a long journey. Uh, as they say, life is lived forward, but always understood backwards. So I want to try and explain some of the things which I've understood backwards and what's happened in, the, in terms of that. Then the second part will be what it means to be an entrepreneur and what it means to start to build communities and get people to pick up and run with things which you want to happen. Uh, and then the third part will be about you, what you do differently, how do you move forward differently and so on. 
So if you're okay with that, and I've got your hopes and fears right, I will make a start. Um, so I was born in a place called Ghana, um, and uh, I've got a, here a picture of my mum. This is my mum. So when I was nine months old, my dad died. So I was brought up by a single mother, by my mother. Um, and I learned so much about change people projects and so on from just watching her. Because when the adults are talking, I did a little boy sort of running around their feet. And just a couple of things which I learned very, very quickly. I learned, for example, that people were really strange. So for example, oh, this is my mother, another picture of my mother. So this is from 2017. And this is my mom as an avatar giving a presentation in virtual reality. So you probably realize that she's not an ordinary person, okay? 90 year olds don't do that, she's 96 now. She's pretty smart. Um, she was the first lady to get a doctorate from Ghana. And watching her go through her life, what I discovered was she had a maxim, which was if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And she used this and applied it to everything. And she didn't really see herself as a woman who was being stopped. She saw herself as somebody who wanted to do stuff and things got in her way. And it wasn't about who, who she was, it's just life. And I remember her, one of the funniest things and one of the most crucial things I learned about how you live your life. She would often go to meetings and there were a couple of people who in the meeting, a couple of men in the meeting, who would, one in particular, who was really quite not helpful at all, okay? And when they are sort of scuttling around their, their feet and it turned out this guy had had the stroke, he was very ill. And as they were talking, it became quite clear as the conversation went on. You see, this is the problem. He thought he should be doing better than she was. They were same sort of level in the organization. Why? Because in his mind, he had some software which had errors in it. So because he thought he should be doing better, it made him stressed and miserable he was not and made his behavior happen. Often when people talk about discrimination, they talk about it in a cartoonish way. No, 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 it's far more complicated than that. The person doing the discrimination actually often suffers more than the person being discriminated against. Because one, he didn't have access to what my mom could do for him. So you lose assets. He was stressed. He had this stroke. The person who's doing the discriminating is also struggling. So if we start to think about things in a more holistic way, it's far more useful because that also stops you getting into what I call victim mentality. It's hard to lead, hard to be a change maker. If you go, oh, every time I try to change, somebody stops me, okay? So that was one really crucial thing. The second thing I learned was that people are humans and they are people first. The only time I ever saw her, she had three kids, you know, stressed, trying to do this job. I actually really upset was one evening, she had been to a party, dressed herself up beautifully, went to this party. Lots of people she knew were there, including the workmates, the wives of the workmates, all of the people she knew. And all of the women had shunned her because she was single, really attractive, really, really well dressed. I don't know what was going on in their heads. But what I learned from watching her was that people are really strange. You know, any cartoon illustration of what separates us is wrong. We're all in this game together. What was happening was they felt threatened. And of course they did. So they were reactive. Nothing wrong with that. But the real thing to realize is that the modern idea that somehow or other, we in Africa, we across the world, if you're not, um, I don't know, if you're, if you're African, if you're dark, somehow we have some challenge is not enough to understand how to solve it. You know, yes, if a government is doing something bad, that must be stopped. But there's no such thing as racism. I know you're going to, your heads are going to explode. All the time you imagine that as project leaders, it's taking your energy away. There's one human race. You know, that's why we can all interchange and intermarry. If we were like dogs and horses, we'd have a problem. Am I right? It's one human race. The problem is what's called discrimination. You see something and you choose between them. But discrimination is not a bad thing. Imagine, imagine. You've got a lovely juicy mango. You've got a slightly rotten looking mango. Do you want to choose between them? Of course you do. Discrimination, nothing wrong with it. I'm pleased we have discrimination because you looked at all the speakers around and you went, we want a good final speaker. Let's choose Eddie. Hey, hey, I'm here. Okay. Now it's also possible you looked around and said, we want a really bad final speaker. Let's choose Eddie. But you discriminate all the time. You're watching this presentation. You're not doing anything else. The challenge with discrimination is when it's structured. 
And so when people prejudge, that becomes the headache. Like that man I was talking about who thought he should be better. But prejudging is not bad. Back to your two mangoes. Judging the one which looks right is good. Prejudging on inaccurate data, that's where the problem comes from. So how do people get inadequate data? Usually they're ignorant or they've been told a story or something's been framed for them. So we can deal with that if they can overcome their fear. So my first point is that it's really important, and I learned this running around their feet as a child, to pay attention to everything. Because if you pay attention as you live your life forward, you'll be able to make more sense of what's going on around you. So, just starting with that, I, I think my main message from that is always realize that opportunity is there to be grasped. Anything which is in your way is just a thing. Don't label it. It's just a barrier. And if you have no goals, you have no barriers, go for it. So my own experience for building my own career, having told you where I come from, was obviously I grew up in Ghana. And then at the age of about uh, 15, 16, I moved from my school in Ghana, which was a so co-ed school with basically all Africans. I was sent to a British public school, a place called Cranley. And I was the first African or dark person or anyone else who had been there for about 100 years. The previous person had been a chief's son from Ashanti who had been sent there with his whole retinue, including the drums and everything else, okay? So I arrived in this place and it was really interesting because when I was at home and when I was in Ghana, I was Eddie. I arrived at this school and I became black. Who knew? I, I didn't know. You, you see, you're laughing, but it's, it's funny. You have to admit it's quite funny. So I, I was telling I was black. Okay, I, I, I didn't know I was black. I, oh, that's interesting. I said, well, why not? Okay, interesting thing. But what I realized was that the school kids didn't have any concept. It was just a label they picked up. The most important thing for me was not to accept someone else's label. If you accept and apply a label to yourself, which you didn't invent, you limit yourself to their perceptions, their prejudging, their ideas. So never apply a label which you didn't invent yourself to yourself. And then I discovered things. They'd come up to me and say, oh, oh, do you live in a mud hut? Now, in these days, they'd go, oh, there you go, naughty person, you're saying something bad. But what I realized was they had no clue. I was in an exclusive public school, and they asked me whether I lived in a mud hut. They just didn't know. And I'll just give you the reverse story, because that's also funny, because then you start to understand how important it is as a, a project leader to see reality and, and, and how, how to build on that. So one day, my study was up uh, about here-ish, okay? And there was like a big open area. And one, one afternoon, I was walking through the open area. And as I walked through, I said, I saw this dog hair on the ground, uh, on the floor, in the, in the room. And so I went, and I said, what's going on? Someone's brought a dog in here. There's all these piles of dog hair everywhere. And I was like, no, there's no dogs here. See, what I have to try and explain to you is it wasn't dog hair, it was human hair, but I had never seen hair cut. I'd seen Europeans with hair on their heads, I'd never seen it on the floor, but I'd seen dogs with straight hair. So from my perspective, I was probably just as racist in the modern era as they were, but it was just ignorance. Look, as long as you're generous, as long as you focus on your goals, as long as you continue to look for what you're trying to look for, that's the most important thing. And you have to realize that when you're confronted with anything new, your past experience is probably going to lead you to the wrong answer. That's why you have to be open-minded, pay attention, and as a project leader, keep learning. Because if you don't, you can never deliver what's being asked of you. So that was my, my sort of uh, experience at school. Uh, and then I started learning other things. These things are crucial because I see so many projects which fail because people don't get the scope right. So um, story I'll tell from my life, um, university, started meeting friends from school in Ghana. Um, obviously I went to school much younger, they now come. And every time I met them, I met up with them, they would complain, they say things like, well, you know, I went to the shop and the shop assistant followed me all around the room, discrimination and racism. And then somebody else will have another story. I had no stories. I couldn't work out why I had no stories. I was really worried, they've all got good stories. <laughs> And, but after I met them each time, I would notice I'd get a story afterwards. Let me explain what's going on. Reality doesn't care a little bit what your perception is. 
So it does funny things to you. If you've ever bought a car, you'll know this. Before you buy the car, you're busy thinking to yourself, oh, I love that car. There are not many on the road. It's going to be really special. Can you tell me what happens the day after you've got the car? Have you noticed how the, they're all over the roads everywhere? Did they buy lots of cars just to come and flood the roads? No. What happened was your perception was different. Your perception changed. So when people pointed out the challenges they had, my perception had also changed. And I began to understand that it's really important always to check what people really mean. So for example, when I speak to a client, oh, by the way, I'm weaving the learning points into the stories. So I hope you're taking notes. When I talk to a client, they tell me, I want this, I want that, I want that. And I always use the same phrase I recommend to you when you're scoping something or when you're having any conversation, you say to them, let me just be clear that I've understood what you are trying to do. In other words, your attempt to see reality, not just confirm your biases. And they go, okay. And then you try to describe it back in your own words. If they go, yes, 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 you're probably good. If they go, yes, and there's this thing, and they go, no, not at all, then that's really helpful because that means you didn't hear what's going on. You heard what your bias was telling you. You looked for what you were already looking for. So I went, made my way through university, came out the other end, uh, worked for a company called Shell, and that was another learning experience because what happened at Shell was I was working in research. I was working on ways to clean up these, the gases from the North Sea before they ship them uh, uh, on shore. So really making some little, little machines which would do it. And I joined Shell, they gave me this project. The project was running by the time I got there. And of course I was working hard, so I went, I'm gonna work hard. So I was working hard on this project. It's going really well, I was, it was experiments. So I was growing bacteria and all sorts of things. And then I heard one day that a chap called Lionel Barnes had been saying very rude things about the work I was doing. And I went, what's that about? And he handed my son. And then a few weeks later, all my experiments just stopped. The bacteria died, everything was broken. I can't understand this. And then one of the lab assistants said to me, you know, I saw Lionel near your equipment with some files and things. The guy has sabotaged my experiments. So I rushed up to him, et cetera, really angry. But it was my fault. It was my fault he, sub he, he went and sabotaged my projects. It was my fault. Why? I was suffering the same thing. You see, I didn't know he'd been kicked off the previous project and they had been handed to me. And he was probably also in that prejudice mindset of this young guy from Africa coming and doing it. He probably thought I was going to fail. All the time he thought I was going to fail, he was going, ha, 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 ha. Then he saw I was succeeding. When a stakeholder moves from thinking you're going to fail to thinking you're going to succeed, they begin to be active against what you're doing. So he became active against what I was doing. It was my fault. I should have known he was a stakeholder. Stakeholders come in three formats. They hold a stake like they're trying to kill Dracula. They hold a stake like you're going to hammer it, so you have to trust them. Or they hold a stake like a financial stake or a reputational stake. I should have seen he was a stakeholder, and I should have realized that the project wasn't the research. The project involved all the people around it and all the soft elements, and I should have managed the complete project. So again, by paying attention and understanding that, I discovered what stakeholder management was really about. So, I finished at Shell and I moved to um, uh, work for a company called Linof March. And they used to do these sustainability energy recovery things, a chap called Bodo Linhoff. And when I started on that job, um, I'd come out of research at Shell. I'd been doing complicated things. I went into a company where we would walk around the whole factory, calculate all the numbers, and so on. So I had a little guys, would you know, know what an apricot computer is? Does anyone know what an apricot computer is? I mean, basically it's like before Apple, they have apricots. <laughs> Terrible machine. Okay, anyway, I had one of those. So I just did all the sums, which everyone else was doing on the calculator whilst walking around the factory. I just went, got all the numbers, done. Okay. And I presented it to the chapel with my supervisor and I learned something else. He took out his calculator and started trying to redo what I'd done on this complex spreadsheet, which would take me a day and a half to build. He was going to check my work. When you are changing things and you are on that learning journey, everyone you need to bring along has to go through that journey. You have to go back for them to hold them, to build trust, 
in order to walk them to where you are. Otherwise, they resist change. They go in the wrong direction. Or worse, they try and reinvent what they understand. Remember my comment that new things tend to be hijacked and banjacked by your old experience. And that's what had happened to him. So in that job, I did a great job. I think I, the, my design won European energy efficient uh, plant, um, ever, best ever in the world. Uh, so in Europe, uh, and I think it was actually the world, but I got fired from the job. Why? Because my bosses had no idea what I was doing and I hadn't taken them through the journey. So I had a project which had succeeded on the hard side, actually had quality accolades, a really big quality accolade, and here I am, I had failed. When you understand that, you understand that delivering a project is about delivering the hard stuff as well as the soft stuff. It's about finding the stakeholders and also understanding the scope properly, real scope, so you can deal with it. At that point, I then moved to a place called Ashridge Business School. If you've watched Harry Potter, you will recognize some of the rooms in here. So while I was at Ashridge, I learned another really quite crucial uh, lesson, which was that when you start to think about uh, making something happen, you've got to really think about the stakeholders. For years, they've been trying to modernize all their brochures and make things streamlined. And every time they tried, it failed. And I got the job of trying to do that as part of generally a business round. Now this building, you won't recognize, realize, but underneath it is a massive basement from when it was uh, a place where rich people lived, okay? And that massive basement was full of people doing all the jobs. Every time they tried to modernize, they wouldn't talk to them. So they'd come up with something which made their lives better, and then the other guys would resist it, the people in the basement. So I went and spoke to them. I found out what was really their challenge. I listened to them. I tried to deal with the reality, just as I've explained. And then we were able to actually make the transition and they liked it. And this is the rule. I hear people all the time say, let's make the world better for the next generations. Let's make the world better for people. Honestly, it's not a thing. You cannot make the world better for any person, any stakeholder you have not met or who hasn't briefed you. You are just guessing. Chances are you're going to make their lives different and probably worse. So as a project lead, whatever your vision, remember this, it's impossible to make the life better for any stakeholder you haven't met, especially the next generation. What you can do is ensure that you don't make it physically worse in your space so that if they choose to change it later, they can. I.e., if you chop down all the trees and kill off all the animals, the next generation can't put it back. So it's really important to understand that stakeholder focus. From doing all of that, I then understood that I had to be able to work on how to do things because people needed that to make the projects work. And so I left, and I'm going to tell you the next phase when I started to try to become an entrepreneur. Stopping there. Punza, are there any good questions for me? Any juicy questions? They are absolutely amazing questions, Prof. And I think you've kept the audience so glued up to their screens. But mm -hmm. let's keep going. Uh, I think one important thing for me, the question that comes up for me is, Lionel, the subwatcher, how differently would you have dealt with him now, Prof, now that you know everything that you know? Okay. You talk about stakeholder engagement in a fascinating way, and I'm learning so much. And I'm saying, in re on reflection, how would you have dealt with Lionel? Well, so now I would not have had a Lionel. He wouldn't have arisen. Because when I start the project, I start to look for the stakeholders. I find people are going to benefit or be damaged. I talk to those stakeholders and ask them, who else might be a stakeholder? Because I mm -hmm. want to find them before they find me. Because if I find them, then I'm in control. If they find me, then they're surprised and they misbehave. So finding them, I gave you those three reasons somebody's a stakeholder in advance would mean Lionel would never arrive. And having identified him, I would have gone to speak to him and said, you know, I've taken on this project. I know you've done a lot of it. Is there any advice you'd give me? Uh, would you come and like to see what we're doing? And I would have brought him in. And then he could go around going, well, of course, I, I gave Eddie some of my advice. And he'd be ever so pleased with himself. No material impact on the, the, the success, but I have a happy stakeholder who's then moving forward. Therefore, I can make change happen. Absolutely. We have a very interesting question from Afari 
Musilio, he's saying, are we, are we saying that we should not plan for the next generation? And I think he's extrapolating from the message that says, any stakeholder you have not met, you cannot plan for them. And I think the messaging there is that you need to meet them to understand them. You can't, I, I meant you cannot say you are making their lives better because you don't know their needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you said, okay, mm -hmm. I think that what we can do is we can make it more choice for the next generation as people, for their careers, opportunity, for the environment, for the habitat, that gives them more choice. They can decide what better looks like. So you can then plan to stop destroying habitats. I mean, Africa is so wonderful. If we industrialize the same way the West has done, we will destroy it. And the West, mm -hmm. When in the old days, when a tractor went down a field, there would be birds following the, the tractor because they were eating the worms, because the soil was still alive. Mm -hmm. Now, when the tractors go down the field, there are no birds because the soil is dead. There's nothing living there, just fertilizer and a bit of dirt. So if we if we say we want to plan for the next generation, we can say to them, well, let's not kill the worms because you can't bring the worms back. Killing the worms is a strategic move. So you choose to do things which mm -hmm. are non-strategic, giving options to people you've not met. Instead of trying mm -hmm. to get- I think the last, thank you very much, Prof. I think you are answering the last question from Mohammed because you are talking strategy. You're not just talking and giving us specific answers. He's saying, how can a pandemic situation uh, how, how will it contribute in developing effective response mechanisms in project management and for avoiding and mitigating such setbacks? And I think you are touching on it because you are telling us about not just project management uh, lessons, but about life lessons, yeah. which are broad enough to deal with all of this. Exactly. So the thing to remember is that we're talking about making change, okay? And when you talk about making change, I'll just try and explain to you what what happens with change, oh, just very quickly. So um, if, if I was to draw the universe of change, so this is change, 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 C-H-A-N-G-E, change, okay? That's the change uh, universe. Some of the change makes things better for you. It's called improvement. Some of the change makes things much worse. <laughs> Are you with me? Changing something doesn't necessarily mean it's made it better. Mm -hmm. Also, some of the change is change, which is just more of the same. Some of the change takes you through what's called transformation. I saw mm -hmm. that one of your speakers had used the analogy of the butterfly. Okay, that's one of mine. I, give, I tend to come up with models and really spread them around the world. And I'm always so pleased when people have stolen them and used them. So I use that as a way of explaining the difference between projects and, and, uh, and, and transformation. Transformational change leaves you outside where you are. So, so if we're going to invent, we need to really think. So let me tell you about being an entrepreneur very quickly. I'll tell you what I've learned about projects from that, and then we'll move forward. So if I, I'll stay here, it's easier, okay? So, um, so I started with the, as you saw the picture before, I had to leave Ashridge, why? Because what a number of things that happened to me roughly and very quickly. The first was that I got asked to invent a project management course because the course we were running wasn't going very well. I was quite lucky because I just had a, a guru, a chap called Ellie Goldratt, and he taught me a method, which is what is behind this one. I'll talk you through it. Start here. It says, I have a high workload, so I don't have time to plan or to do or to be creative. So I don't realize how much work I'm committed to. I've only done half. So I say yes more than is realistic, pushing my workload higher, which then gives me uh, less time to plan or to do or to be creative. And because people now... I, uh, I worry that uh, I come close to my deadlines. People are worried they'll miss theirs. They interrupt me. So my whole day is just jumping from one message on my text to the next, pushing my workload up, giving me less time to plan. So now people send me things even at night and it goes round and round. And my life is a bit of a mess. I suspect some of you will recognize that happening for your colleagues, <laughs> not for you. <laughs> okay, why? The world stretching and targeting, challenging. Things have gone south. We know that. Lockdown crisis, nightmare. Okay. But everyone's still doing things the way have, they've done before, and they have very little effect. So there's something missing here. So when I analyzed this, I realized that from this technique, I could look at projects. So I used the same technique of causality mapping to look at projects. And I discovered this one, three things people can't stand about projects. Costs too much, takes too long, doesn't work, 
The team are fed up. The business is unhappy. It doesn't like it or the sponsor is unhappy. Happens in like 70 plus percent of projects. Why? Same pattern. Oh my goodness, we're running late again. Why? We had to redo it all again. Why? Because something went wrong. We hadn't evaluated our risk. Why? Because we didn't do the risk evaluation. Something here about planning, coordination, risk management. Oh my goodness, the team are fed up again. Why? Oh, they had to do it all because the clients, uh, clients weren't met. Clients changed their goals. Why is that? We didn't involve the client. Something about stakeholder management. Oh my goodness, the team are not delivering. Why? Because I haven't managed them. So they haven't been very involved. Why? Because I'm busy. Why don't you use your team? Well, they're new, they're in different countries. I didn't know how to do digital. You know, I can't get commitment from the other people. It's a pattern. So I used this and built a course. And in doing that, I began to understand that I was in the business school structure. Remember what I said about the structure? And that structure was constraining me. And the world outside was very different, but I couldn't get to it. And the model which I used, and if you watch my TED talk, you'll see it, was a very simple model, which basically said, look, it's as straightforward as this. This is now, that's the past. This is things like the pace of change, the number of people on the planet, um, the amount of interaction and delivery, et cetera. We all know that now is higher than the past. And we all know that it's getting faster and faster and faster. We all know that. I think I missed that. This is the world. That's not interesting. But we also know that once upon a time, we could learn faster than the world is changing. And we know that we are learning faster, but that one's a bit of a straight line. So for all of us in the past 15, 20 years, those two lines cross over. This is the world of waterfall. You can learn fast and the world is changing. Therefore, you always know what you're going to do and you know how you're going to do it. This is the world of everything else. Sometimes you know what you're supposed to do. Sometimes you know how you're going to do it. Sometimes you don't know both, especially in an entrepreneurship, but you have to do something. So what I learned from that was that projects were different. A lot of people will be running a project which is quite clear. And some of them will be running quite an unclear project. They often use the same methods, but now they don't, because now we know Agile works better here and Waterfall works better here, but we didn't know that. So I went out and started making these stories happen, but I was constrained in the business school environment. So now I had a problem. I had to decide if I left the business school. Does everyone here know the yin and yang symbol? You know this symbol here, right? I don't know, I've not got it right. Do you know this one? So this is a really old symbol. And it's very important because what it's telling you is that there are two spaces in the world. There is this space here. This is what we call the known universe. How do you feel when you're, you know stuff? You're in your house, everything's cool, you're here, okay? Suddenly the wall of your room falls out. What happens? You immediately go into chaos, uncertainty. Do you think people like to be in uncertainty? No, because in the old days, a million years ago, if you went into this space, you were just now about to get eaten. So we do everything in our power to try and get back to what we already know. We're all designed like that. As an entrepreneur, you now have to step <laughs> into the unknown. Do you understand how tough that is? Because everyone else around you is in the known. And now we're global. All the narratives, all the words we use are all global. We get comfort from doing what everyone else does. It's called social acceptance. But to make change, you're gonna to have to step into the unknown. You start with your idea and your idea is a really cool one, but somehow you have to jump to, I'll call it bucks, I'll make it happy, healthy people. You've got to cross that. The way you cross it is by using projects. The way I crossed it was with two steps. First thing, there's something I call a gap leap. A gap leap is a very simple tool. You take a piece of paper, you write on it how things are and where the gap is which your innovation will fill. Scribble, scribble, scribble. You then spend some time discussing what happens if you don't do anything. Customers are unhappy, people in the villages are not good, etc. You describe what would happen if you could fix it, all the good things. Then you discuss why has no one done it yet? Why has no one done it yet gives you the scope of your project. You can do this on your own, but it's much better to do it together with people who will be stakeholders. It's very good fun. It gives everyone the same view, the same vision. Then the second step, pretend you finished. Think of how proud you're feeling that you finished. 
look back in time, discuss what are the things which I must have done to get here? Well, we must have organized the first meeting. We must have gone to see the government. We must have seen the customers. We must have made sure we're compliant. List all the jobs. That is your project plan. This works well in uncertainty. So that was what I did to try and turn myself into an entrepreneur. I took the things I'd learned from Ashridge. I took my understanding that human beings hate change. I started to use some of the tools. I call them performance enhancement tools. The tools I developed for projects, I applied to myself. And on the back of that, I was able to build a business, uh, which then gave me all the things which whom I, was whom I was describing. I've advised government. I've taught top 250 companies in the world. Uh, and the list goes on. I mean, the UK, the way they allocate money for investment is more using one of my models, the Sparks model. It's copied around the world, Hong Kong, and so on and so forth. So a lot of the things just came from me going out and stepping to the unknown and then letting people come on that journey with me. Bums, are there any good questions I need to answer? They are absolutely amazing questions, Prof. You are intriguing everyone. The question on the floor is, um, how do you make stakeholders who are bent on making your project unsuccessful, happy and su supportive of your project? I think you've touched on that. Maybe let's handle the second one, Prof, when it says we have organizational change, project-specific changes. Which one precedes the other for successful project management? That's for Martha Olwenye. That's a really brilliant question. So um, let me just share, because it'll be easier if I just share the screen and then, then I can scribble and we can, we can go through and have a look. So, um, so two things happened. So what I realized first, oops, let me just get another page. Okay. What I realized first of all, was that um, the model which we had in our minds of how um, this one here, Okay, I've told you about different types of change. I have names for them. You'll hear that I say things like foggy change or going on a quest. Those are different types of change which allow you to work. But what's interesting is once I've done that and I knew those five things which I described, stakeholder management, leadership, and so on, I was then able to start to predict what would go wrong in a project in an organization. And then I had a client and what happened was they tried running out all these projects so as a retailer but they only had 15 minutes training for the people on the tills. So I realized that actually they needed to bottleneck their whole program by the 15 minutes training. And so I created something called integrated change management. Think about the corporate strategy. That turns into some sort of program of activities. The program of activities then turns into projects. The projects connect with the processes running through the organization and the people, which is really crucial, okay? And so it's actually like an ecosystem in itself. It's not one follows the other. The other. They always have to be in balance. And if they're not in balance, then bad things happen to you. Let's continue, Prof, right until the end. Great. OK, let's keep going. So in the last few minutes which I've got, what I want to do is talk about you. Um, the first thing is you're about to make change in a world which has never been more dangerous. Let me turn the screen share off. And I will explain why. Over the past 15 years, we've learned some really scary stuff. What I mean is, when I used to teach project management, I would concentrate on leadership and team building and stuff. I would, leadership would be, would be very sort of above board. And then I noticed that techniques from, say, marketing were coming into our world. So if you've read people like Robert Cialdini, you'll know that there are about six things which if you do persuade people to act, even if there's no logic behind them, even if it doesn't match reality. If you, uh, if you follow that and you start to understand, if you've read people like George Lakoff, you'll understand how easy it is to hypnotize really large groups of people to do things. So the process is very simple. And the reason it works is because as human beings, we survived for billions of years. How did we survive? By being able to survive, not by knowing what reality is. I'll give you a test. They watched the sun go past. The sun went past. They went, the sun must be going around the earth. Everyone, went, yes, yes, yes. Then one chap decided, no, 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 no. The earth goes around the sun. And I think they killed that one. Then they killed the next one because you see, the new thing did not match their past experience. Remember, I told you this. And so they had to reject it. Okay. So after a while, they went, oh, yeah, the earth goes around the sun. So I don't know, put your hand up or comment. Is, which one do you think makes more sense? 
The fact that the earth goes around the sun or the fact the sun goes around the earth, which of those two makes more sense from what you observe? The answer is both of them. They both look exactly the same. They both look exactly the same. And in fact, what's funny is the reason you're getting day and night isn't because the earth goes around the sun, it's because the earth is turning. That looks the same also, you with me? So we have a world now where it's really difficult to understand reality. And if you're an entrepreneur, you're about to put your life into doing something and your solution doesn't match reality, you have a problem because reality always wins. Um, I'll give you some, some, some examples of things which I watch, which I find intriguing. So for example, I'm very concerned about habitat destruction. You probably noticed that, I really hate it. And people are very concerned about climate change and CO2, and I don't like that either. And I said, look, I live in the West, it's cold. At home, of over half the energy we burn is for heating ourselves up. But I used to do this thing called skiing, where you stand outside in freezing cold with snow all day. You don't burn a single carbon. And so I was thinking, hang on, we're burning all this carbon, but I can be out of doors and I don't burn carbon. Why? Because I dress appropriately. Then I come in in the evening and I take off all the nice warm clothes, put a fire on and blast air into the outside. So if you wanted to solve CO2, it's doable. It's doable. But what happens is because we don't see reality, we think, oh, it's a different problem. What we need is wind turbines. Do you understand? As a project lead, trying to make change, trying to build a business, reality always wins. So I'm going to jump to a different room where maybe some of the um, some of the elements which we've covered could be picked up. So um, I, I I put here a couple of things for you to to see. So if you couldn't read my my horrible drawings and my 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 bogus writing, um, I've tried to reproduce them so that you can actually get a better sense of what they are. So this is the curves which I highlighted. Over here is the gap leap which I was talking about. Uh, over here is the sticky steps. If you want them. I've also put up here, uh, just, just get in touch. And if you get in touch with me uh, at Eddie O'Bang, as at, at Eddie O'Bang or um, yeah, on Twitter or LinkedIn, I will send you a link and all the materials which are in there. So I'm going to stop at that point. If I've done a good job by now, you know things like most important, never, 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 ever compare yourself to anyone else. If you don't compare yourself to other people, you will be so much more powerful. That's one thing. Uh, the second thing to, to recognize is, um, I think just stopped. Oh yeah, there you go. Uh, the second thing to, to recognize is that if you make decisions about yourself and say you can't do things, you are actually discriminating against yourself. That's a bad thing. If I've done a good thing, I've also managed to help you understand the importance of paying attention, getting the scope right, making sure you've understood your stakeholders, engaging around your stakeholders, looking at where things, things are coming, planning an uncertainty, being able to make sure that you bring people with you by taking them one step at a time and not surprising them. If I've done a really, really good job, by now you've understood the importance of creating outcomes which give other people options. Why? Every single, almost, every single problem we have today comes from yesterday's solutions. Almost every single problem we have today, think about it, as you drive home or as you walk around, you know, go, oh, well, you know, we're making too much suits. Oh, well, you know, there's too many people in the city. Whatever the thing is, you will discover it came from yesterday's solutions. So I'm gonna wrap there. For me, project management, entrepreneurship, innovation are all part of the same game. But for you to build this ecosystem, you have to first understand yourself. But when you connect with people, try to connect with them from their perspective. Understand what they want, if I've understood you correctly. Put them first, contribute to them. You will discover that together you build trust. And hopefully together, you can build a wonderful ecosystem for innovation in Africa. Bunza, I'm where I've got to get to. Is there a final question or anything I need to say? This was too powerful, uh, Professor. And you know what? I can't even rehash what you've just said. You've taught us not just about project management, but about life. 
So if I'm a good student, Prof, let me remember, you said it is important to pay attention. Every, pay attention, always realize, always. Yeah, yeah, the opportunities are always there. And yes. if there are any obstacles, don't give them any name. They are just that, they are obstacles. Yes. And you only have you obstacles when you've got goals. No goals, no obstacles. Absolutely. You said we need to see reality as it is. Yes. You can't accept anyone's label of yes. yourself. And I think that's where you said we need to know who we are, not accept anyone's uh, labels of who they say we are. And you, you said when we're confronted by something new, we must always know old solutions will not play. So you must always be willing to learn as a project manager. Keep learning. You said reality does not care about your perceptions. <laughs> you said always check with the clients the scope what is the scope don't leave it to your own perceptions because you'll get it wrong always recheck and you said an important question is i understand what you said what you're looking for is and you said we must restate it according to how we understand it and you said when you are learning everyone is on a journey so you can succeed phenomenally as a project manager, but if you're leaving people behind, <laughs> you may be sabotaging yourself. Let me tell you what the most amazing part for me was the gap leap. Yeah. The gap leap was just the totally amazing part for me. Prof Eddie, I am so amazed by your speech. I did not set the standard low and indeed <laughs> you, over, you have it's outdone kind. yourself. And um, I think everyone has heard that Prof. Eddie is available on LinkedIn. If you're looking for some of the tools, the lessons, please do follow him on uh, LinkedIn. He is at Eddie Obeng on Twitter. He's also a, a Professor Eddie Obeng on LinkedIn. You have been phenomenal. And thank you so much for the lessons. Thank you for the observers of life that are like you, who don't just go into the red race, but observe life and you learn and you teach. We have been wowed. Thank you so much for being part of the conference today. So to all our listeners today, we are going now to take you through a short video that is talking about, um, it's, 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 it's a visual leadership video. And then we go off to the close after that. Ladies and gentlemen, we are close to the end of the conference. It has been phenomenal. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from whichever part of the world you're from. I'm Agalia and today I'm here to talk about visual leadership. And people might be wondering, you would have heard about leadership. Leadership is a mindset, leadership is an attitude, there are traits uh, involved in leadership. But what is visual leadership? Before getting into the topic, a little bit about me. I'm Agalia, I'm a visual thinker. I facilitate creative collaboration, which means I do a lot of mind mapping sessions and I brainstorm a lot between participants, between large and small group of people. I brainstorm a lot of thoughts, ideas, put creative, strategic and analytical thoughts together for people, come, people to come to a solution. And I'm also a graphic recorder, which means I uh, get key highlighted points and I get uh, the conversation and record them graphically for people to take forward for their next meeting or for their next agenda or for their next action plan. Uh, this sets as one of the milestone and one of the documented structure that they carry forward with. And I run a firm called Naumenberg, which facilitates future. Uh, and by facilitating future, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, you know, certain skills that as leaders we are expected to have. Right now we are in 2021. By 2025, every leader will be expected to have analytical thinking and innovation skill, active learning and learning strategies, complex problem solving, critical thinking and analysis, creativity, originality, and initiative. But if you just keep seeing these words coming in again, again and again, all you could see here is there is analytical thinking, there is strategy, and there's creativity, which is exactly what wishful thinking is all about. Wishful thinking is a collaboration of creativity, analytics, and strategies, putting them together, helping you to get your internalized thinking process and externalize it, which is like organizing your thoughts. And most of the times we have complex problems and helping them get simplified is what the job of wishful thinking is all about. And as a leader, it is a key skill that if you have it, to take it forward. And why wishful thinking is important. 
First thing, it helps you retain the memory better and engage with another team member or with the whole team, with your subordinates or your boss better. Engagement is better. Set visualized goals with your team and organize tools and ideas help you synthesize your problems, get clarity, simplify complex problems and collaborate better. So it helps you facilitate creative collaboration. Visual thinking is an aided tool that helps. And I've been doing this for the past 10 to 12 years now. And it's so obvious that the results and effectiveness that we see are remarkable. So what is visual thinking in leadership? What is, as a leadership, what is that is expected of you is you are expected to visualize a big picture. Even before anyone could see it, it is expected of you to get to see that big picture. Uh, you're expected to simplify the problem in a very complex form. And uh, you're expected to see how parts connect with each other. And it is not just how parts connect with each other. What are the multiple probabilities that these parts can connect with each other? Wishful thinking is one tool which will help you storyboard better. So create what the next step is going to be, what today is going to look like, what tomorrow is going to look like, what a week from now is going to look like and create roadmaps, which is what the month is going to look like, what the next quarter is going to look like. Create mental models. So now given the journey, how am I going to structure these ideas that I have as a process? And finally, the metaphors. How am I going to imply this metaphor? If I'm sailing in a boat, who are those resources that I'm going to take? Who are those teammates? Who are those people who are going to be with me? Who's, which is that lighthouse that is there, which will take me forward, which will guide me through my route? And which is the path that I'm going? Wishful thinking enables you to connect in terms of metaphor to help you see that big picture. Having said that, we have come up with a visual leadership course from Naugin Verb. And what is this visual leadership course all about? It is a three-day workshop and how to lead through visuals. It is happening between September 10th to 12th, two and a half hours every day. If you want the time zone, you can see it beneath. It's New York, 7.30 a.m. and Amsterdam and Johannesburg, 1.30 p.m., New Delhi, 5 p.m. and Singapore, 7.30 p.m. And what is this whole uh, leadership, visual leadership workshop all about? It starts with yourself, you know, to start with the first day is about leading yourself. What is your purpose and why do you want to do it? The second is now that you know the purpose, how are you going to align with that team? Who are the people that you're going to have and how are you going to collaborate your thoughts with their thoughts and form something beautiful? And the third day is about the big vision, the big picture that we've been talking about, how are we going to build that? So from day one, which is the purpose of what I want, and to day three, this is the vision that I'm building going forward. And this is what the three-day workshop is all about. And if you register today, there is a 50% off for PMI members that we are offering. So I would ask you now that you have the offer and you know about the course and you know about the value of course, if you register today, you get a 50% off uh, for you all. And you also have one plus thing, which is a bullet journaling course we are taking from Noun and Verb at 18th of September. That comes as a value add for all those people who enroll, uh, which is a ticketed event, but that comes as a value add with this visual leadership course for you all. And if there is a way that you want to contact me to know more about this, the credentials on the left are those ones you connect with. I'm in LinkedIn, Gmail, and Instagram. Or if you want to mail me, you can mail me with the subject PMI VL, which is visual leader, or PMI BJ, which is visual, uh, sorry, bullet journaling. Uh, if you want to register today and avail the offer right away, and you don't want to question, no, have you don't have any questions as such, you can just key in this URL, www.townscript.com slash e slash PMI, and you will be directly guided to the registered page. So I am going to look, I'm going to look forward to seeing you all in the workshop. Um, thank you so much for your time and I hope it is useful and I hope to see you all further. Thank you. Hi everyone, Sunil here. I just wanted to briefly stop by your virtual conference to say a few words. You'll have heard by now that I will be departing from PMI at the end of this year. 
and pursuing an interest that I have in transformation and driving social impact in the world of business. This was a really difficult decision for me, but I know that it was the right one. And I'll forever be grateful to our global PMI community for inspiring me in so many different ways. That especially includes our volunteers, members and stakeholders from across the Africa region. I'll never forget the spirit and enthusiasm of everyone when I joined you at the PMI conference in Tanzania in 2019. I'll never forget it. We had chapter members from all over Africa, from Kenya, Uganda, South Africa, Nigeria and Cameroon. And when we were all having dinner, we were all sitting at our individual tables in there and everyone was in their esteemed national colors. And then when the music came on, slowly people started to jump up onto the stage and start dancing. And an amazing thing happened. First of all, I think it was the Cameroon team and that table that stood up first and they started to dance to a song. I think it was Jerus Jerusalem. And it can only be described as the African version of the Macarena. And they were in fantastic sync. But then slowly, the other tables all got up one by one. And before we knew it, everybody was on the stage and they were all dancing to, in sync to this wonderful song. The entire audience was dancing to this one song. We were all actually one big team, one single dance to one single song all dancing as one team. Wonderful, wonderful experience. It was beautiful to see. And actually, that sums up the spirit of PMI, bringing together change makers from around the world to make a difference and turn amazing ideas, plans and dreams into amazing reality. And it's your spirit that will guide PMI into the future your growth strategy and your vision for the future that will position PMI as the go-to place globally that change makers will be turning to in order to help them make their ideas and plans come to life. So please do stay in touch and I can't wait to see what you accomplish next. Cheers, take care. Hello, it's Ashwini again. And here we are at the end of what's hopefully been a great day of learning and networking. Here at the PMI Africa Conference 2021, it is now time to say thank you to everybody who has made this event possible. First of all, I want to thank our chapter leaders for being very generous and unstinting with their efforts over the past weeks and months to make this day happen. They work shoulder to shoulder with PMI staff, to whom also a very big thank you. Great teamwork and exactly what we would expect from a community of change makers. To our speakers and sponsors, a very warm thank you as well. This would not have been possible without the generosity of your time, your energy, and of course, your ideas. An event like this takes a lot of doing. There are the inevitable missteps, there are the inevitable uh, miscommunications, recovery plans, and in the end, somehow, due to the perseverance of everybody who's working hard, working smart, it all comes together as it did very nicely during the day today. We will look forward to welcoming all of you next year for the PMI Africa conference, which will be in Lagos, Nigeria. In the meantime, for everybody who's worked behind the scenes to make today happen, take the time to rest, pat yourself on the back for a job very well done. And if you've been in the audience, if you've been listening in, I certainly hope that you've been able to take away a few interesting things, perhaps a tool or two, an idea or two to try out, to be a change maker, which was of course the theme of the conference, Africa and Ecosystem of Change Makers. See you next year. Abiento.